Good morning. Today is the 15th Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost. The theme for our worship this morning is the church is militant, first the cross, then the crown. We are using morning praise this morning. If you are following in the hymnal, it begins on page number 45. Otherwise, your service is printed for you in your worship folder. I would ask that you please rise and join me in singing the morning hymn. Samson forfeited his faith in God and came to ruin, but in the end God forgave. 
But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to celebrate, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their god, saying, Our god has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. O oh, God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two center pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the tomb of Manoah his father. He had led Israel 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 31. We'll sing it to the tune of hymn 379.
second lesson are words of Paul from his letter to the Galatians. We read from chapter 6. In this lesson, some of the early Christians were being persecuted for their faith because they did not follow the laws of Moses, and especially the law of circumcision. And so they decided to forsake or to avoid persecution and suffering for Christ. They would circumcise themselves. So we read from chapter 6. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this 15th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Matthew's gospel. We read from chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what, may, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Christ. We will continue with him 431.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Fellow sufferers for Christ. No pain, no gain. It is a mantra of many an athlete. If an athlete is going to get the gold medal or be part of the championship team, he or she must be willing to endure pain to get there. The pain of exhaustion, the pain of exertion, the pain of training is necessary for the athlete to be successful. Or if you or I try to lose weight or to build our muscles, you're going to have to endure pain, the pain of hunger, or the pain of exercise. No pain, no gain. Same is true about spiritual things. If a Christian is going to achieve the goal and claim the prize of heaven, he or she must endure pain in order to get there. No pain, no gain. It was also true for Jesus. In order to claim the prize of being the Savior of all sinners, he had to endure pain before he got there. It was true for Jesus. And it is true for those who follow him. The road to glory goes through the cross. Christ died on a cross, and Christians carry a cross. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. If you recall, in the gospel lesson last week, Peter and the other disciples made a fine confession of Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus followed up that fine confession by telling his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed. Jesus showed by word and by action that it was absolutely necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to, and to endure many things at the hands of his enemies, things like being spit upon and hit, by being brutally beaten and mocked and flogged and finally being killed by them by being nailed to a cross. This cross was necessary for Jesus to bear. Since it was God's will and God's plan to make Jesus the sin bearer and the savior of all people. It was predicted many years before it even happened. When Isaiah wrote, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. But this cross that Jesus suffered would eventually lead to glory. Even though Jesus had to suffer many things and die, he would on the third day be raised again. On the third day he would be triumphant. Triumphant over sin, the devil, and the grave. And 40 days later he would ascend back to heaven from where he had come to reclaim the glory that he had given up for a time to endure the cross where he was exalted at God's right hand forever, never to be humiliated again, forever being praised as the Savior of all sinners. 
The author of Hebrews wrote, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus knew, and it was God's will, that his road to glory would go through the cross. But Peter was not happy with that arrangement. He rebuked Jesus for even saying so. He told him, this will never happen to you. In the original Greek, Peter's words are the strongest way you can say something negative. Peter very much did not like the idea of Jesus suffering and dying. Why? Because it didn't fit his idea of what a Savior or a Messiah should be. As fine a confession as Peter and the other apostles made of Jesus, Peter and the other disciples misunderstood Jesus' mission. In line with the thinking of the day, they thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly king who would, with great power and glory, restore Israel to its former glory and set up an earthly kingdom. And this talk of Jesus of a cross and of suffering and death didn't mesh up with Peter's understanding and expectations of glory. As Jesus diagnosed, Peter was not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus immediately saw through, through Peter's rebuke and recognized that it was his adversary, Satan, speaking through Peter. Jesus told Peter that he was acting as a stumbling block to him. That Greek word translated stumbling block literally means trap stick. Maybe if you're a hunter, you know something about this. The trap stick was the stick that held up the box. And when it was pulled out, the box would fall down and it would trap the victim inside so that it could be killed. Satan was tempting Jesus through Peter's words, trying to set a trap for him, trying to make him stumble on the way to the cross. Satan was tempting Jesus to forsake the cross and to spare himself the pain and the suffering and to spurn God's plan of going to the cross at all. Satan did not tempt Jesus in this way to spare him any kind of pain or suffering. Of that, Satan was not concerned. Satan tempted Jesus in this way because he does not like Jesus' cross. Because Jesus' cross spells his defeat and his demise, and it robs him of his power and his leverage to send people to hell to suffer along with him. Because on his cross, Jesus took away the sins of all people. Thankfully, Jesus overcame this temptation of Satan. As he overcame all of Satan's temptations, and he remained sinless, and he was resolute to go forward to Jerusalem to bear his cross, the cross of suffering and death. No pain, no gain. That's how it was for Jesus. His road to glory went through the cross, and so it is for those who follow Jesus. No pain, no gain. The Christian's road to glory also goes through the cross. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? After making it very clear to his disciples that he had to go to the cross, Jesus spoke of the cross, that those who follow him must endure. Part of that cross is denial, self-denial. 
Those who follow Jesus must forget their own will and conform their will to God's will. They must be willing to lose their life for his sake. Which simply means giving up their guilty pleasures and their glittering treasures and the fleeting glory of this life because they follow Jesus. In addition, those who follow Jesus must carry a cross, meaning they must endure some sort of suffering because they follow Jesus. This suffering might include, but it's not limited to, things like pain and shame and disgrace and dishonor and name-calling and even death. Part of following Jesus will inevitably be carrying a cross. But Jesus assured his disciples that their cross like his would eventually lead to glory. He told them, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus was telling his followers that those who deny themselves and take up his cross, who lose their life because they follow him, will in all actuality gain life. Those who follow Jesus will find life. Real life. Because they will find spiritual life in the forgiveness of their sins. Which then will lead to life even after death. And a resurrection from death to eternal life in heaven. And to being conformed to the likeness of Jesus forever. Jesus knew it. And it was God's will. The Christian's road to glory goes through the cross. But Satan is not happy with God's plan for the Christian's life. So Satan tempts Jesus' followers just like he tempted Jesus. He tempts them to avoid the cross at all costs and to save their lives. He asks them, if it's really worth it to deny themselves? Is it really worth the cost to carry the cross? And as Satan tempted Jesus through Peter, so Satan tempts Jesus' followers through the sinful world in which they live and that sinful nature which lives inside of them, the Christian sinful nature does not like or enjoy any kind of suffering, and it shrinks from pain. The Christian sinful nature does not want to sacrifice a single thing. In addition, the sinful world encourages Jesus' followers to gain the whole world, to grab all that it has to offer, and to reject God's will for their lives, and to do whatever pleases them. But the choice of listening to Satan is a grave one because those who listen to Satan's temptations forfeit their soul to eternal perdition. We all know the cross or the crosses we have borne or are right now bearing for Jesus. Maybe it's anxiety or pain in our body or suffering in our soul. Maybe it's feeling disgrace or shame from somebody else because we follow Jesus. Maybe we're dishonored because we follow Jesus. Maybe it's those things that we have given up because we're trying to conform our life to God's will. We know those crosses. Do we always carry our cross willingly and obediently? Do we always willfully do as Jesus asks? No, we don't. Not always. Sometimes we listen to Satan's temptation. And we heed the siren call of this world. And we balk at the cross Jesus expects us to bear. Or we might bear it, but it's with much whining and complaint. We might deny ourselves things. But inwardly, are we lusting after those very things that we deny ourselves? So 
so often we fail to do as Jesus asks us to do. We reject God's will for our lives and we endanger our soul. Do we deserve anything but God's eternal punishment, you tell me? Thankfully, God sent his son to save us. He conformed his will and his life perfectly to his father's will to make up for our shortcomings and our faults. He willingly and obediently went to the cross to be the voluntary sacrifice for our sins. He cleansed us from our sins through his blood so that we will stand before the Father one day clothed in robes of white forever singing his praises. We join with the saints in heaven who are continually singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It is true. No pain, no gain. Our cross leads to our glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by singing the song, We Praise You, O God.
We will continue with a portion of the service entitled, Lord Have Mercy. This begins on the top of page number seven. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Savior. May this devastating earthquake be a reminder that your Son will soon return to judge all people, and in light of it, help us keep our faith alive so that we are ready for that day. Heavenly Father, we also thank you for your word, inspired by your spirit and written on paper by Ben you chose. Bless our study of your word as we begin our Bible classes and Sunday school. Inspire many to take advantage of these opportunities to hear and study your word. Open the hearts of those who study, that they might grow in their faith in you, their love for one another, and their Christian living. Forgive us for taking your word for granted and for failing to study in it. Preserve your word among us, as many church bodies and people forsake it for worldly ideas and opinions. Let it be proclaimed in its truth and purity, here and everywhere. And, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful, and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Good morning again to all of you. Um, it's a lot of announcements, so I'll go through them with you. There is a coffee hour after the service. It's going to be a potluck brunch. I know the ladies have been busy preparing that for you, so please come down and join us. There's a van and evangelism committee meeting following that brunch. Uh, Sunday school begins next Sunday. That's the 17th. It's at 9 o'clock. It's held at the school building. There is a display concerning Sunday school in the entrance. You can look at that for information. Our Sunday morning Bible class, we're continuing our study of Jesus' parables. It begins at 9 o'clock every Sunday and lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, if you have those minutes, please join us. Um, our Wednesday morning and evening classes, I've decided to postpone them. Not uh, from this Wednesday till the 20th. I think it's the 20th. Yeah. So we'll start up on the 20th. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that, but we're going to postpone that beginning till the 20th. Um, confirmation class begins next Sunday following the worship service. We're going to meet at the school building for that. Uh, there's a council meeting Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Women of Faith is next Tuesday, the 19th. Yes, um, that meeting begins at 7 and the blood drive, you've heard about that. Um, the sign-up sheet if you'd like to volunteer to help with some of that. And um, church recently purchased me a new color printer. It's a good thing, and it works out well. The old one is downstairs on a table. It needs a new cartridge, but it's only three years old. It works fine. If you'd like it, take it. It's yours. At least get rid of it so you can have it. And then one more thing. My wife told me this one, so I have to remember that. The, you've seen this announcement in your worship folder about LWMS prayer calendars. Is there a sign-up sheet posted for that, or didn't you get that up? It did not get up. If you're interested in ordering one of these LWMS prayer calendars, talk to Laura after the service, and I think next week there'll be a uh, sign-up sheet posted for that. Um, so... Uh, like I said, if you have questions, ask the Lord. I have nothing else. Does anybody else have anything? Or any? Um, since we are going to eat, and since I won't be down right away, why don't we join in the common table prayers? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen.